In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just want to say before I begin, as I begin, that I love proclaiming the gospel in the midst of the people. So thank you for allowing me to do that. So this gospel today, this action of Jesus in the temple is often cited as an example of violence on the part of Jesus. Our peace lover is kind of showing a bit of an edge. But I say it's to the contrary, because this is an example of Jesus breaking down structures of violence. He is disrupting the status quo. There was a system of sacrifice allowing one closer access to God who was kept in the Holy of Holies. Access to God depended on position, family, money. In other words, power. Some were allowed in, while others were kept out. There was a hierarchy that depended on spilled blood, the blood of animals, and the blood of people. So what do we think and believe about sacrifice as 21st century Christians? Both the corporate sacrifice and personal sacrifice. Especially now, in this season of Lent, it's a penitential season, and so one of the things we do is we give stuff up for Lent. We give up, we make a sacrifice of giving something up. Temple sacrifice was commerce in action. We hear it referred to as a marketplace. A generous sacrifice, a more perfect sacrifice, if you will, bought greater access to God. And so we might be thinking, well, thank God we don't do that anymore. But we have to ask ourselves, or do we? In our Eucharistic prayer, and you'll hear me say it in a few minutes, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which is different. And hopefully our intentional sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving is not confined to one hour on Sunday morning. God's love and presence to us is not confined to Sundays, nor is it confined to a church building or a particular space in that building. God's love and presence is all around us, and it is for everyone. We had an interesting experience here this week, and some of the people who were there are here this morning, and will know what I'm talking about. Now, as we know, the Samaritan Center is in the midst of moving, and so two things were planned for to happen this week as they look to move out of their space and into their new space. One of the things was that every day the meals were being served out of a small doorway on Montgomery Street, this doorway that stands between the chapel and the sacristy right back here. And, you know, as I saw that there, I imagined it was much as it was back in the beginning when uh, it all began, when they were handing out bag lunches there. Oh, I'm not sure where they handed them out, but I know that that's what they did, was that they handed out bag lunches. My mother was a part of that ministry all those years ago. So for about an hour or so, the door to the street between the chapel and the sacristy was open. And it was cold out there. And so it became cold in here as well. And then two days in, the mid, in midweek were spent taking out large pieces of equipment. I, the way I understand it is this is equipment that's going to be refurbished and moved into their new space. And it was huge equipment. I couldn't believe what they were able to get up the stairs and around the bend in the landing and up and out the door, again, out, on, out to Montgomery Street. So the doors to our main entrance in the foyer on Montgomery Street, they were open for quite a while. And it was cold. It was still really cold. Now, on one of those days that they were taking out the equipment, the doors were left open for a little while after they finished. I don't think it was very long, but the doors were wide open and no one was around right there outside or near the door. And as we might expect to happen, somebody wandered in. A woman came in looking for help. She wanted to clean up 
She asked for a pair of boots, needed to use a phone to call her social worker, and self-identified as being mentally ill. She actually shared quite a bit of her story in the short time that she was here. She was very animated, loud, with flailing arms. She might be described as aggressive, and she might have been experienced as threatening. All the while, as I stood listening, I was attempting to assess the situation, and what I saw was pain and I was trying to determine a response. And I realized that there was little that I could do. Mary Beth came by and we learned that this woman's name is Kathy. And eventually Kathy left of her own accord, but not before her behavior caused some degree of alarm. And after she left, the doors were closed and locked. We were safe, but Kathy was not. So I ask, is that what God intends for us? To be safe and lock others out? Trying to lock God up in the temple? The temple of this building? And the temple of our own bodies? Do we not allow Christ's light to shine through us for people most in pain and suffering? Surely it cannot be what God intends for Kathy. She did say to me at one point that helping her is what churches are supposed to do, and I could not argue with that. Did God bring her here? Is a person like Kathy a sacrificial victim of our culture? And the systems intended to provide health and wholeness failed her repeatedly throughout her life. And now those same systems look to lock her and others out. Kathy is an extreme example, but sadly not an uncommon one. Now, I am not suggesting that we fling the door open. That's not really helpful to just open the doors and leave it at that. We need to do more than that. And I think it would be extremely helpful if we began to see her as a child of God, like us. Yes, different, but also the same. To see her as a child of God and to not let our response to her presence be one of fear. Other, less extreme examples of sacrificial victims may stir up different responses in us. It's not always fear. It might be distrust. It might be disdain. It might be annoyance. Or perhaps the worst, I think of all, complacency. It matters not to me. Throughout these weeks of Lent, we've heard about the suffering and pain of Jesus and his disciples' reactions to it. We've also had three funerals lately with readings about eternal life and want, losing one's life to save it. These are all tied up together. There is a lot to think about, and there is a lot to pray about. Thursday morning, we had a small gathering for morning prayer in the chapel. And on the other side of the door, breakfast was being served, as it had been all week. Breakfast and dinner were both out this door. And those serving breakfast were mindful of our presence in the chapel, and they tried to maintain some quiet. But those of us in the chapel really weren't concerned about any of the noise. Because, you know, really, you can't serve even a bag breakfast and coffee without some conversation and hopefully some joyous laughter. The activity on the other side of the door informed our prayer in the chapel. And in the midst of praise and thanksgiving, we prayed for the guests and for those who serve. We are so all tied up together. It's really amazing. 
So today, I also pray that we will be released from fear. I also pray that we will see that all God's children are loved by Him. And that we will be so moved to allow the light of Christ to shine through us as we look to overturn the systems that attempt to contain God's love. Just as Jesus was doing when He overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. Amen.